Hi, everyone. Now that everyone's seated, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Kendra, and I'll be your MC for the evening on behalf of the Law Society of Western Australia. Um, and I'd like to officially open the 2021 Sir Ronald Wilson Lecture by first introducing Matthew Maguire to conduct our Welcome to Country ceremony. Matthew. Thanks, Kendra. It was a bit quick, a bit quick for me. I wasn't organised. Um, Kaya nana. Ngani the Europe ni jina kolenjwa, ni jina wanju ni nana yeye yeye boja. Ngala boja, bolu boja wa, wajok boja, nyonga boja. Ngala kemoot, ni jina ni nima, kora kora. Ngani ni jaa da wang kenywa, jaa moot, ni jaa boja. Ngani jurup ni jana wanju nuna ke yak nuna ke mamen beri awat ni jana nyanyi ba. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honour to welcome you to the land of the Wajok people, an area we call Bulu. Um, in the Wajok um, area of uh, the Nyungar Nation. I welcome you in the first language of the first people of this country. Ngani jana wangi mamen ke adeba ngani ni jana jana kolonyi ba nuna ke jurup ba ni jana nyanyi ba. Berdoan kolonya, nona kau mahaya mahaya, nona kau bojowa, jawab ni jawa kolonya. Ask that my old people's spirits can be part of this evening with you tonight, and to look after you whilst here, just as importantly when you travel home to your own homes and families later on, that you have a, a safe journey. Especially those who are probably not of this area and may be here visiting by chance, that you have a safe journey here. Whilst on Wajok country. Ngalaga Murut Nitin and Yeniba, Kura, Kura. Ngalaga Nitin and Yeniba, Yea, Yea. Burdowan, Burdowan. Ngalaga Kulunga, Kulunga, Nitin and Yenin. Ngan Kulunga, Nonago Kulunga, Nitin and Yeniba, Ja, Yeniba, Ja, Wuja. This is a land that my people have occupied for thousands of years. It is a land that we occupy today and call home. It is a land that we will occupy for thousands of years to come. Our children, our children's children, mine, yours, living here together as one on this one, uh, this beautiful land. Yera calling you a nigger, the devil, you again, Jerry Garrua, here, Pigeon calling you a nigger, the Maya, Nigger Bujoa, Nalagangank. The way I like to explain our, flam our families belonging to this country is how the water runs through here. From the devil, you again, to the Jalgaru, the Swan and the Canning, and all the smaller waterways carrying Nalagangank, uh, um, Ngorp, carrying our blood through this land on through to our mother. A, our provider, this land that we live on. It's an honour to come be back here and be part of this with the Law Society. I've done a couple of them, these in the past, pre-COVID, and um, thanks for again for the acknowledgement of the Wajok people and the Nyungar people of this area of which we call home. This, I would like to share a song with you. This is a song that comes out of a place that we call uh, Karkarap, and it sings about driving away bad spirits to allow good spirits to come in. So, like I said earlier, we can have a safe time here tonight and on home to our own homes later on. The area that I'm speaking of is uh, called King's Park. And it's a song that's been handed down to my father and onto myself and my brothers, and we share at gatherings like this um, to ward off bad uh, spirits and stuff to allow good ones to come in to look after us all. <clears throat>
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Kendra and Dean, for having me here. And again, like I said earlier, for the acknowledgement of our people, Wajok people and Yungar people. And um, sorry, before I leave, if I might say something. In looking at the titles here tonight, it sort of makes me think of a story. My, my father was in Brookton at the time, living in, as a, a young married man. And he, working on a farm as a farmhand, they were seeding. And as, some, as a lot of you would know with seeding and that on farms, and it, that goes for 24 hours or pretty much until they get all the seed in the ground. And so it's just go, go, go. And my dad got picked up one time coming home late one night after, after seeding by the cops in Brookton because they had a curfew for blackfellas there. And he was thrown in jail. That's his only one criminal offence that he's got against his name and has had for since that time. And he was that embarrassed about it he told my mum off for telling us boys about it. And um, that's how proud he was about being a you know, fine and upstanding person, of which they've rubbed off under us, and um, we proudly carry our culture and our songs and our dance, and um, I'm more than happy and willing to share it to not only people who want to learn about it, but people who want to know how and why we are connected to this country and it to us. So thank you for having me. Have a wonderful night tonight, and um, safe travels home later on, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you for sharing your story as well. I too would also like to acknowledge the Wajak people, the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet today, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and extend my, that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the audience today. So before we move on to the lecture, um, I thought I'd just tell you a bit about myself and my background. So I am a newly admitted lawyer currently working at Cause Chambers Westcarth in the city. I'm also a management committee member of the Society of African Australian Lawyers. And I was born in Ghana, Africa, before moving here when I was quite young. So I started out in Karanup, went to Karanup Primary, and then later went to Churchland Senior High School. And I remembered while being at Churchlands, not knowing what it was that I wanted to do as a career. And I thought I would become a professional netballer. Uh, a couple injuries set me back. I then thought maybe I'd do physio or become a psychologist. I did a couple courses at UWA and realised it just wasn't for me. So I re-evaluated and I thought, what are my values? And am I able to find a course that aligns with those values? And even if it's not something that even if it's not a, a career per se, at least I'll feel personally fulfilled having done that. So when I sat and thought about this, I thought I value people being treated equally regardless of their position or their professional uh, education. I value people being treated if they've had more disadvantage in life, they should be given a, more of a leg up. And I think I also then the world will be a better place. And I think that leads us to the importance of being here in this lecture and the importance of engaging in topical issues and making sure that the legal and political systems of today align with our societal values. So the Sir Ronald Wilson Lecture was established in 1986. It was established to provide an opportunity for legal academics and people familiar with the public face of the law to discuss issues of relevance to the year 11, 12 politics and law curriculum in a public forum. Previous presenters included Sir Ronald Wilson himself, a distinguished Australian lawyer, judge and social activist serving on the High Court of Australia. Notably, he was involved in the inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. This resulted in the 1997 Bringing Them Home report, which our presenter will touch on today. And in recent times, the Sir Ronald Wilson Lecture has been graced with the presence of the adjunct Professor Dennis Eggington, Winthrop Professor Stephen Smith, the Honourable Justice Jeremy Kernois, and I believe he is here today, the Honourable Robert French AC. 
Before introducing the presenter, I would like to acknowledge the following distinguished attendees. The Honourable Judge, Judge John Sword, Stewart, the Honourable Judge Chris Stevenson, the Honourable Robert French AC, the Honourable Ralph Simmons, Professor Robert Cunningham, Rebecca Lee, Greg McIntyre SC, and Daniel Costa. Thank you for your attendance. So our presenter for the evening is Emeritus Professor Rosalind Croucher AM. Now Ms Croucher was appointed as president of the Australian Law Reform the Australian Human Rights Commission in July 2017 after seven and a half years as president of the Australian Law Reform Commission. In 2014, not only was she acknowledged for her contributions to public policy as one of Australia's 100 women of influence, but she was awarded the Australian Women Lawyers Award, which recognises women who have provided long-term leadership and commitment in support and advancement of women in the legal profession. In the Australia Day Honours List 2015, Professor Croucher was made a member of, the, member of the Order of Australia, and in 2016, Macquarie University conferred on her the title of Emeritus Professor. We are great, very grateful to Ms Croucher for kindly society And the ability of the Commission. The report is the Commission's most downloaded report and the educational resources about it, also the most accessed. It is a report of enduring and continuing influence. There are clear connections with the year 11 and 12 politics and law units of the senior school curriculum on accountability, the protection of rights in Australia, and the status of international treaties in this regard, and democracy and the rule of law. I note also that the Year 12 syllabus includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures as a cross-curriculum priority. I will start with Sir Ronald's journey to the role of President of Herioc. On the 7th of February 1990, Sir Ronald Wilson became part-time President of Herioc. He was 67 years of age. He served in that role for seven and a half years. Just call me Ron, he would say. So I will. At five feet, foot four, in short in stature, but long in energy. Born on the 23rd of August, 1922, the youngest of five children, he had lost both parents by the time he was 12 and left school at 14 to become a permanent public servant on his 15th birthday in the record office of the Crown Law Department in Perth. He also learned to touch type as part of his administrative exams. He had a strong work ethic and strove to be the best he could be, proudly reckoning himself as the best records clerk imaginable. In November 1941, Ron joined the Australian Imperial Forces and served in the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. After the war, he went to the University of Western Australia, graduated with a Bachelor of Laws with first class honours and was articled to the Crown Law Department. In 1957, he was appointed the, Crown, the Chief Crown Prosecutor and built a formidable reputation as a forceful and some would even say a ruthless prosecutor. With increasing civil work, he was appointed Crown Counsel in 1961, a position created for him. And in November 1963, at the age of 41, he became the youngest person to be appointed a Queen's Council in Western Australia. And in 1969, he was made Western Australia's Solicitor General. By the time of Ron's appointment to the High Court in 1979, under the coalition government of the Honourable Malcolm Fraser MP, he was regarded as a leading authority on constitutional law. Ron was the first Western Australian to be appointed to the High Court bench and brought considerable criminal law experience to the role. As was the usual course for appointees to the High Court, Ron was knighted. He was 56 years of age. Human rights lawyer and academic Frank Brennan, SJ, 
then a theological student, attended Ron's swearing in, which happened to be in Brisbane. At the end of Ron's remarks, Brennan recalls turning to a friend saying, I think they have just put a saint on the high court. Not bad for a member of the Uniting Church. It was, however, an appointment that Ron accepted reluctantly out of a sense of duty and loyalty to his state. He had been asked before and he had declined. In 1989, Ron left the High Court early at the age of 66, after nine years on the bench, shortly after he became the national president of the Uniting Church of Australia for a three-year term. In February 1990, Ron was appointed as president of Herioc by the Labor government led by the Honourable Robert Hawke MP to replace Marcus Einfeld, an appointment that was suggested by some as calculated to save the commission from abolition if the coalition did gain power. Ron also became deputy chair of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation. As Robert Nicholson observed, in that role, Ron tackled some of the most difficult issues of justice facing the nation. Speaking at the time of his Herioc appointment, Ron said, it never occurred to me I'd have an opportunity to enrich my retirement in this way. I'm delighted. His attraction to the human rights field was because of his involvement with the Uniting Church and because of the time he had spent with Aboriginal people, listening to their concerns and helping to start the Aboriginal Legal Service. I note in present company the central role also played by the Honourable Robert French. Ron was charismatic. In contrast to the turbulent and tense tenure of his Herriot predecessor, Ron was universally liked and admired. He was welcomed warmly by Herriot staff and his fellow commissioners. Susan Roberts, who joined Herriot as a senior legal officer in 1994, said that Ron engendered love and respect from the staff and he could light up a room with his presence. The Commission's Executive Director from September 95, Diana Temby, said that Ron also had a wicked sense of humour and steely determination. He was absolutely impossible to resist and it was impossible to deal with him on a day-to-day -day basis and not love him. At the beginning of his time as Herriot president, Ron was described as circumspect and not wanting to embroil the commission in political controversy, particularly understandable given the concerns about his predecessor. But in the ensuing years, Ron was to become more forceful in expressing his views. Not only did he feel unshackled from the restrictions of judicial office, but he also saw his responsibility as president to speak out on human rights. Ron found his role liberating. Once again, he said, I could do what I love doing the most, that is advocating, and now I could do it for the disadvantaged. In September 1991, Ron delivered the Mitchell Oration, an initiative of the Equal Opportunity Commission of South Australia, in honour of Dame Roma Mitchell, who had been, among other roles, the foundation president of the Human Rights Commission, the predecessor commission to Herioc from 1981 to 1986. In this oration, Ron gave, force, gave voice to some of his thoughts about human rights. His lecture title was framed as a question, human dignity for all, a pie in the sky, Ron referred to the Universal Declaration of Rights, Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which together form what is described as the International Bill of Human Rights. He also listed the other human rights instruments then in place and noted that a declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples was in the process of preparation. All of this, he said, was a respectable body of law designed to encourage members of the UN to fill, fulfill the hopes of 1945, when the founding document of the UN, 
the UN Charter was signed. In an address to Murdoch University students in 1993, Ron expressed his own philosophy of human rights. It's a question of the inherent dignity belonging to every human being, simply and solely by virtue of his or her humanity. It's a question of equality of opportunity. It is a question of freedom, justice and peace for the whole world community. It is a question of international law and the obligations that Australia has assumed by its adoption and ratification of these instruments. To Ron, it was unacceptable for Australia to ratify international human rights instruments and then only partially enforce them. He considered that it was his obligation in his role as president of Herioc to advocate for human rights, particularly for the marginalized and disadvantaged sections of the community. He had an acute understanding of his statutory role as president of Herioc and the respectable body of international law that framed it. And through the exercise of the role in the context of the bringing them home inquiry, inquiry Ron was transformed. On 11th of May, 1995, the then Attorney General, the Honourable Michael Lavarch MP, under the Labor government of the Honourable Paul Keating MP, referred to the Commission an inquiry into the forcible removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. The report was completed in April 1990 and the provision of services. It was two and a half years after International Human Rights Day 1992, when Prime Minister Paul Keating said in an address at Redfern to launch the UN International Year of the World's Indigenous Peoples that we took the children from their mothers. Ron and Mick Dodson, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Just Justice Commissioner, took primary responsibility for conducting the hearings for the inquiry. They were assisted by other Heriot Commissioners and by the Queensland Discrimination Commissioner. In each region that the Commission visited, the Commission appointed an Indigenous woman as a co-commissioner. Hearings were held in every state and capital territory and, and territory capital city, as well as 32 country centres. The Commission heard from 535 Aboriginal individuals and in total from 770 people and organisations. The Commission also received about a thousand stories in writing and numerous other written submissions, including voluminous submissions from state governments. The inquiry led to the report, Bringing Them Home, National Inquiry into the Separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children from Their Families. It was concluded in April 1997. The title for the report came from the evidence of Aboriginal poet James Miller at the inquiry hearings in Sydney, who said, we need to bring them home. Leading this inquiry, said Robert Nicholson, brought to the fore all Ron's considerable personal talents and professional experiences, as well as his beliefs and humanity as an individual. The report was to be Ron's blowtorch moment. In my first formal speech in my role as president of the Australian Human Rights Commission, at a conference of the International Bar Association in Sydney, I coined this phrase. I said, having a devil's advocate for human rights is a healthy, indeed necessary thing in the context of the promotion and protection of those rights, even if it means we should expect criticism for calling out government against the commitments made to the international community in signing up to the international treaties that set the benchmark for human rights, even if it means that governments see us more of the devil's blowtorch than the devil's advocate. 
One of the questions I have been musing upon in reflecting on the history of the Commission, and especially this year, which marks the 40th anniversary of our establishment and just after the 40th anniversary of the International Covenant and Civil and Political Rights and its ratification by Australia. I've been reflecting on the blowtorch moment that may have faced my predecessors. This was Ron's. Among, among the recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report were that an apology should be given for separation to be participated in by parliaments and churches, as well as restitution, rehabilitation and monetary compensation. Another recommendation was for a national sorry day and that the Commonwealth should legislate to implement fully in domestic law the Convention on the Protection and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. The report also concluded that the Australian practice of Indigenous child removal involved both systematic racial discrimination and genocide as defined by international law. Yet it continued to be practiced as official policy long after being clearly prohibited by treaties to which Australia had voluntarily subscribed. A section of the report focused on international human rights. It was here that the discussion on genocide is found. Australia ratified the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide on the 8th of July 1949, and it came into force in 1951. As explained in the report, the Convention confirmed that genocide is a crime against humanity. This expressed a shared international outrage about genocide and empowered any country to prosecute an offender. A state cannot excuse itself by claiming the practice was lawful under its own laws or that its people did not or do not share the outrage of the international community. The definition of genocide includes the forcible transfer of children from a racial, ethnic or national group to another group with the intention of destroying that group. The analysis of the application of the convention's meaning of genocide was a technical one, traversing policies of assimilation and mixed motives, including the evident good intentions of some policies. The conclusion was that the label genocidal could be properly applied to the forcible removal of children from Indigenous Australians to other groups for the purpose of raising them separately from and ignorant of their culture and people. It stated official policy and legislation for Indigenous families and children was contrary to accepted legal principle imported to in, into Australia as British common law and from late 1946 constituted a crime against humanity. It offended accepted standards of the time and was the subject of dissent and resistance. The implementation of the legislation was marked by breaches of fundamental obligations on the part of officials and others to the detriment of vulnerable and dependent children whose parents were powerless to know their whereabouts and protect them from exploitation and abuse. Within the Commission, however, the question of whether to use both concluded that genocide was relevant to the findings and conclusions of the inquiry. Ron recognised the shock that would attach to the genocide label, but willingly agreed to it. As Antonio Booty explained in his marvellous biography of Ron, from which I draw heavily in this paper, the inquiry hearings had been a life-changing experience for Ron. He had heard story after story of sorrow and pain that had convinced him a major injustice had been done that needed to be understood by all Australians and measures taken to rectify the historical injustices. He, along with the other Heriot commissioners, 
believed that they had been trusted with the stories and had to honour that trust. This meant ensuring that the report presented the story and the case for justice, no matter how uncomfortable it would be for white Australia. Wilson was prepared to proceed with and argue the case that the past removal policies and practices constituted genocide. Mick Dodson, however, was not so sure about the wisdom of using this label. At the November 1996 meeting in Sydney of all Heriot commissioners, inquiry hearing commissioners and the Indigenous Advisory Council to discuss the final draft report, Dodson was sceptical of the genocide finding and was not prepared to agree to it. Ron, however, passionately argued with Dodson that the removal practices and policies constituted genocide as prescribed in the Genocide Convention. As Booty explained, Dodson worried about the political ramifications of such a finding. His concerns were prophetic. However, after listening to Wilson's arguments, he was persuaded to agree to the genocide finding, as were the other commissioners. It was decided that the term genocide was correct and appropriate. And as Wilson said, it gave greater force and persuasion to the claims for reparations. The crux of the argument was that the removal policy's intention was to destroy the Aboriginal race by assimilating the next generation of Aborigines into mainstream European society and culture. The policies intended to assimilate Aboriginal children into white society so that they would lose their Aboriginality. The recommendation was a symbolic one, that the Commonwealth legislate to implement the Genocide Convention with full domestic effect. In his Sir Ronald Wilson lecture, Robert Nicholson said that these and other recommendations entered the political realm and became the subject of intense debate and by some intense anger. Where terms of reference are provided by an attorney general as distinct from an inquiry at the initiative of the commission itself, it may well be that governments change in the middle so that the attorney and government that commissioned the inquiry is not the one to receive its result. This was the case for the Bringing Them Home report. The inquiry was given to the commission by Lavarch of the Paul Keating Labor government but on the 5th of April 1997, that 689-page report was delivered to the Honourable Darrell Williams, AMQC MP, the Attorney General of the Coalition Government of John Howard. The Howard Government had been elected on the 11th of March 1996, ending a record 13 years of coalition opposition. The political environment could hardly have been more different than in 1992 when Paul Keating had made his Redfern speech. There were other elements in the environment. Pauline Hanson was elected in 1996. The Wick case was decided on the 23rd of December of that year. The High Court holding that native title could coexist on pastoral leases. And then the government's 10 point plan was announced late in April 1997, watering down native title uh, rights in response. This was not an environment to be receptive of the bringing them home report, let alone a finding of genocide. As Booty observed, it was a report the government did not want about an inquiry it did not call at a time that could hardly have been less welcome. Booty's chapter that considers the aftermath of the report is titled, unsurprisingly, In the Eye of the Storm. I describe this section of my presentation as a case of shooting the messenger. The report was tabled on the 26th of May the first day of the Reconciliation Conference in Melbourne. 
However, leading up to the tabling, Booty describes the subterranean campaign to discredit both the Bringing the Home report and its principal author, Ron Wilson. Although 28 commissioners had signed the report, it was Ron, the former High Court Justice, who was the focus of the media and the critics of the report. Ron, of course, could not speak about it at all until it was tabled. On the 20th of May, the Sydney Morning Herald ran a front page story referring to unnamed government sources condemning the report, even though it had not yet been tabled. Margot Kingston also wrote about the attempt to discredit Ron in an article entitled, Report That Won't Stay Under the Carpet. Kingston referred to the advice of Yes Ministers Sir Humphrey Appleby to his MP, Jim Hacker, about how to suppress an inconvenient official report. Hacker's advice, discredit the man who produced the report. This must be done off the record. But as Booty wrote, the government had a problem in seeking to discredit Ron because, as Margot Kingston commented in the Sydney Morning Herald, referring to the Sir Humphrey strategy, he is a former liberal appointed High Court judge, widely respected and a man near retirement. Sir Humphrey's lines of attack that the inquirer harbored a grudge against the government was a publicity speaker who was trying to get a knighthood were not available. A government press statement was made on the 21st of May, referring to aspects of the yet untabled report. The statement attacked the report's genocide finding and dismissed any suggestion of awarding compensation. This is a classic case of shooting the messenger. On the 26th of May, the opening day of the reconciliation conference, the report was tabled. But by then, as a result of the acrimonious buildup um, in relation to many of the key findings and recommendations of the report, most of them had become public knowledge before its release. As well as the genocide finding and the compensation recommendations, it was widely known that the report would call on governments to apologize for the child removal practices. The mood at the opening of the conference was very heightened. The atmosphere was electric and poisonous. The prime minister, John Howard, was jeered and heckled as he defended his 10 point plan on native title. He refused to make or commit the government to making an official apology or to providing compensation. Many turned their backs on Howard. He did make a personal apology for past treatment of Aborigines, but said that Australians should not engage in national guilt and shaming. Rather, we Australians should acknowledge past injustices and focus our energies on addressing the root causes of the current and future disadvantage among our Indigenous people. As the report was now tabled, Ron could speak to it. In an ABC radio interview on the first day of the conference, he said that he and those involved in the inquiry would continue to fight for justice for the stolen generations, irrespective of the Commonwealth's response. He also fervently defended the claim of genocide. He maintained that the removal process came within the definition of genocide in the UN Genocide Convention. He reiterated his determination to fight for the recognition of the plight of the stolen generations, saying, governments come and go, and we are on a long haul perhaps, but we are heading for reconciliation. Launching the report on the second day of the conference, Ron said it was no ordinary report. He was wearing a black sweater emblazoned with Aboriginal art depictions and the words walking together. He said the inquiry was a life-changing experience and presented him with the greatest discipline of his career. 
I had to learn to listen, not just with my legally trained mind nor my presidential demeanor, but as a human being stripped bare of preconceptions and judgments and available to be moved and changed. Listening, he said, is the key to understanding. Understanding is the key to acknowledgement and acknowledgement is the key to reparation. On return to Canberra after the opening session of the conference, the leader of the opposition, Kim Beasley, suggested that the House of Representatives observe a minute's silence as a mark of respect to Aborigines who had suffered injustice. The Prime Minister said it would be churlish and insensitive to oppose the motion. All but one, the Western Australian Liberal member for Canning, Don Randall, rose to observe the silence. Tony Booty wrote how the attacks on Ron and his role in the inquiry began to mount and that the debate over the report raged across the land among politicians, columnists, in intellectual magazines like Quadrant, and at the dinner table. What Ron was doing was using international law principles in the domestic context, his brief under his statutory mandate. The genocide finding was a technical one in that context, and it was not accompanied by recommendations of specific actions against anyone or anybody. The inquiry also followed the Van Boven reparation principles, basic principles and guidelines on the right to reparation for victims of gross violations of human rights and humanitarian law, with a focus on civil compensation, symbolic measures like an apology, and guarantee of non-repetition of human rights abuses. To accusations that he followed a politically correct line, Ron said, in a democracy, the majority can look after themselves. It's the people who are marginalized who need help. Political correctness is involved as a term of abuse for those who have sought to bring marginalized people into the framework of a unified nation. I am happy to be seen as politically correct if that means being sensitive sensitive to the problems of the disadvantaged and working to overcome them. Despite the criticisms, there was a sympathetic reception by most of the media, the academy and many Australians. But the messenger was shot on other levels. The Commission's annual report for 1997 to 1998 is most telling in this regard, reporting that budget cuts taken over a three year forward period represented a reduction of 40% of the budget of the commission. This was just after Ron had delivered the bringing them home report. In considering the criticism that Ron received in the wake of the bringing them home report, I was struck by reflections of the Honourable Robert French AC in his own Sir Ronald Wilson lecture of 2017. Its title was Judicial Review, Populism, the Rule of Law, Natural Justice and Judicial Independence. It framed what I am calling as shooting the messenger as the populist response to judicial decisions. One aspect of French's speech concerned the importance of independent judiciaries and the dangers of attacking judicial officers for their judgments. I quote, while politicians frustrated by judicial decisions will often blame the law in question and seek legislative reform, the populist response to decisions hindering their political agenda is to blame the courts themselves. Like all human institutions, the courts in Australia have weaknesses. They have mistakes and they may be criticized for their decisions and processes. However, criticism is one thing, populist abuse is another. 
French noted the importance of judicial review of executive action in the responsibilities of Australian courts at federal and state levels. And to illustrate his argument about the dangers of populism, French cited an example of an attack on a US federal judge, Judge Robart, by then President Trump. Robart had issued a temporary restraining order against the implementation of the president's first immigration banning order. It was a regular exercise of judicial review of ex executive action in a dispute in that case between the federal and state governments of the United States. But Trump tweeted, the opinion of this so-called judge, which essentially takes law enforcement away from our country is ridiculous and will be overruled. French found this deeply troubling because it was expressed as a denigration of the judge and his judicial authority, carrying the implication that his decision was somehow undemocratic. French argued that the most effective protection against the pernicious effects of populist rhetoric is the work of the courts themselves, expressing in that work their independence, impartiality, competence and efficiency and affirming in every decision they make the rule of law. There are deep resonances in French's speech about the importance of independence in the courts with the role of the Australian Human Rights Commission as an independent agency. Having strong independent national human rights institutions is an expression of the robustness of the commitments of governments across the globe in signing and ratifying international conventions and treaties. The challenge for Australian governments is their willingness or lack thereof to implement the promises made in signing and ratifying these conventions and to accept and respect the independence of the commission as Australia's national human rights institution. Australia was a founding signatory to each of the major human rights instruments, as well as the Charter of the United Nations itself. Overall, we have signed up to seven major treaties and a number of associated protocols. I note in this respect if that if you look at the treaties that Australia has committed to and their rat rat ratification, it is an equal split of coalition and labour support. It is neither a labour nor a coalition project. Equal split. The commitment to respecting, protecting and fulfilling human rights, therefore, should be above politics. But governments have had a love-hate relationship with the Commission, despite the commitment to the world beyond our shores. The Universal Declaration of 1948 was one of the first decisions of the UN, and Australia's own Doc Ebert was in the chair as president of the General Assembly on that significant occasion. It was an aspirational document without binding effect. It was a moment that was also embraced and marked across Australia. Michael Kirby remembers clearly the Universal Declaration of Human Rights being given to every school child in Australia on that flimsy aerogram paper that some of you may remember. But the act of ratifying subsequent treaties is a government commitment to give effect to human rights in Australian law, policy and practice. However, little has been done to enact, to enact the rights and freedoms protected by these instruments into Australian law despite the aspirations perhaps encouraged in the school children of Michael Kirby's young years. This means that the rights and freedoms enshrined in these international human rights instruments are not directly enforceable in Australia, no matter how loudly some protesters over the past year and a half may invoke them. While Australia has not domesticated these international commitments, we did get anti-discrimination laws and on this note, I, uh, on this point, I should note that the Commission 
is at the final stages of a major project and will be releasing our discrimination law reform agenda in the near future. But looking at rights and freedoms more generally, the central piece, direct implementation in a Human Rights Act, never happened despite repeated and current pressure to do so. The Commission itself was built around the idea of an Australian Bill of Rights Act. That was never passed. So while every other country in the Commonwealth of Nations has moved forward by introducing comprehensive human rights protections and legislation, Australia stands alone for not having introduced such protection, at least at the federal level. From the perspective of the Commission's jurisdiction, it is still unfinished legal architecture. We are like a donut with a hole in the middle. The functions under the ICCPR and other treaties are there, but essentially invisible to the general public. A growing set of complaints invoking the right to return to the country and for children to enter or leave Australia for the purpose of family reunification. These are complaints that do not sit under the category of unlawful discrimination in the four anti-discrimination laws, but in what we describe as our human rights jurisdiction that links to the treaties. Complaints under our Act have increased 500% with COVID-19. Masks, travel caps, travel bans, family reunion, people with disability and COVID restrictions and vaccinations. Our overall complaint caseload has also increased nearly 100% over the past year. This human rights jurisdiction is important, but it is limited and essentially invisible. The beauty of a Human Rights Act and other measures that front load rights mindedness is that they are expressed in the positive, affirming rights and freedoms, not just implying them and giving a clear anchor for decision making. It front loads human rights. This is the focus of the other part of the major project I am leading, Free and Equal, the National Conversation on Human Rights, advancing the case for a Human Rights Act and other complementary reforms. This year and a half has brought the absence of such framing into sharp relief. People are talking about rights, people are demanding their rights, governments are defending their rights and incursions on people's freedoms in terms of rights. A greater embedding of our promises to the world in Australian law would provide a better pathway for having such conversations. But until such time, a challenge that the Commission must continue to navigate is that our entire functions are framed through the lens of international law. While French was speaking of criticism of courts and judges in their role within the Australian legal system applying Australian laws, the challenge of the role of the Human Rights Commission, as it now is, is our relationship with international law and conventions of the United Nations. For the complaints that reference the international treaties, a further challenge is also principally that the respondent is the Commonwealth because the acts or practices that we can consider are those by or on behalf of the Commonwealth or an authority of the Commonwealth, which at many times places us in an oppositional position to government. Moreover, the acts or practices may well be lawful under domestic law, but contrary to international human rights obligations. So the Commonwealth has a clear answer to the complaints in domestic law, but in international law, that is no defence. A classic illustration concerns arbitrary detention. Under international law, the fact that detention may be lawful under domestic law is no answer to a question of arbitrariness under Article 9 of the ICCPR. So we have a High Court decision in al Kateb and Godwin in 2004 that essentially um, said that indefinite detention may be lawful under Australian law, but in a continuing series of reports in relation to human rights complaints, the Commission has sought to point out that the approach to mandatory detention and particularly closed detention is approaching the problem 
in the wrong way. The question appears not to be asked whether an individual poses a risk to the community and if there are risks, can they be appropriately mitigated through conditions? The approach has been rather to consider whether there is any need for an individual to be released from closed detention rather than whether it is necessary to continue to detain the individual. I should note, however, that we have established constructive and regular forms of engagement with Australian Border Force and with the Department of Home Affairs as part of seeking to address these broader policy issues within the current policy settings of government. We are still continuing that conversation. But when it comes to our function to consider human rights complaints, domestic law and international expectations are at loggerheads. Returning to the Bringing Them Home report, for Ron, it was like no other report he had been involved in. He was determined that it would not gather dust on the shelf and argued that a positive response to the report by the political leadership of the country and the public was needed. He had openly confessed on many occasions that the report changed him. At a speech in October 1997, he said, I came to this inquiry a couple of years ago as a man over the hill at 73, with about 50 years or more behind me as a hard boiled lawyer, mixing it with all sorts of antagonists and people in the courts here and in England. And yet this inquiry changed me. The reason it changed me is that it penetrated the heart. It got away from my mind. Ron spoke of the patent display of courage in uttering their words, coupled with the pain associated with their utterance, which convinced him and his fellow, fellow commissioners that they were involved in an exercise of the heart, as if the words were being literally wrenched out of the heart. He said, I had never been exposed to such pain before. Ron considered that it was scandalous for people to speak dismissively of the accounts of trauma by saying it was ancient history. The tears of the storytellers convinced him that they were reliving the pain. It was current suffering. In delivering the Commission's Human Rights Day Oration for 2019, the Honourable Peter McClelland, AMQC, Royal Commissioner into Institutional Abuse Against Children, made observations which resonate with Ron's remarks about pain, recollection and truth. He referred to the common use of the expression historical sexual assault as somehow implying a lesser offence or an allegation less likely to be true. He said, neither proposition is correct. As our research indicated, children are most unlikely to report a sexual assault until they are well into their adult years, in many cases more than 20 and often more than 30 years after the offence. That does not mean that some greater degree of scepticism should infect the determination as to whether the complainant is telling the truth. Grief and loss were the predominant themes of bringing them home. Removal as children and the abuse the individuals experienced at the hands of the authorities and their delegates permanently scarred their lives. Moreover, as Ron remarked, the harm continues in later generations, affecting their children and grandchildren. In terms of the ongoing impact of the report, Apologies have now been delivered by every Australian parliament. Compensation schemes have been established in most Australian jurisdictions, either directly for members of the stolen generation, for the stolen wages of Aboriginal domestic workers, or for victims of institutional child sexual abuse. There is also now an accepted understanding demonstrated in the language of the National Agreement on Closing the Gap, the, that the actions of the past affect the health and other outcomes of the present. The truth of what was reported in bringing them home is now accepted and taught across our schools nationally. 
For Ron Wilson, his experience as president of Herioc was the richest experience of his life. To have been able to have a retirement in which I have continued to be an advocate. I loved advocacy. That is why I became a lawyer. That is why I enjoyed my legal life. But now in retirement, to have spent seven years as an advocate for the disadvantaged is the most privileged experience that I can imagine. Robert Nicholson concluded his essay from which his Ronald Wilson lecture of 2005 formed part by saying, Ron Wilson was a great Australian, a great Western Australian and a great lawyer. He led with humility and with talent. His memory is secure in Australian public and legal history and in the hearts of those who worked with him or observed him in his professional and public endeavours. It is fitting that after his life, the vast reach of his ideals should be remembered both for his merit and its continuing inspiration. Nicholson said that the Bringing Them Home report still challenges our nation. And as Booty remarked, the furor that followed the handing down of the report would forever change Ron's place in Australian history. One former staff member also commented to me that men like Ron were men you would crawl over broken glass for. Human Rights and the Australian Human Rights Commission needs such champions. Sir Ronald Wilson died on the 15th of July 2005. He was only 82. In his obituary for Ron, the Honourable Fred Cheney AO said, Ron was always there when he was needed. He used his great talent not to enrich himself, but to serve and lift his country. He was, as Father Frank Brennan remarked, Western Australia's gift to the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Rosalind, for that fascinating lecture. It was great being able to put context to the work that the Australian Human Rights Commission does and to um, Sir Ronald Wilson's experiences. So I'd like to open up a discussion to both our in-person audience and online audience. If you're asking any questions in person, um, please can you wait until the microphone is given to you before asking a question um, and please also state the name and the school or, school or organisation in which you're from. Does anyone have any questions? Hi. Uh, my name is Ben Basil from All Saints College in Perth. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, the big increase in cases that the Commission has had um, since COVID. Um, I was wondering whether it's too early to tell what sort of success those, those cases have had, um, given the uh, loggerheads between domestic law and international human rights obligations that you were talking about, and perhaps given the, the public health uh, uh, requirements as well. Thank you for the question. And uh, once again, I can't see you, but you sounded really um, interested, engaged. Uh, so I'm delighted. To Just be a moment. However, the complaints that go to things like um, travel caps, travel bans, and so on, uh, are ones that involve government. Now there, 
there is no judiciable pathway or enforceable remedies at all. So the strength of our work is in our relationships with departmental officers. And there, um, it's uh, in, in the kinds of issues that we're dealing with, the, the interventions are by way of um, building on established relationships to use the cases that have come to our attention as the illustrations for what solutions are needed. So it, it lies, quite frankly, only in advocacy. Um, it's, uh, the, the cases that, that deal with immigration detention are very difficult ones because the, the, the policy is so totally at odds with the, the approach that we're taking. Now, arbitrary detention doesn't have quite the resonance of genocide, but there is a, there's a brick wall that, that we reach in many cases there. So it's the, our, our strength, our strength in, um, in our role is by developing good relationships with key departments and key ministers. As one uh, former minister commented to me, um, you are much more effective when doors are open to you and you're not throwing rocks against closed doors. They are words that, that I have, um, um, I don't have them on my wall, but I, um, I certainly have them on my brain. So the, our approach is to build, consolidate, renew those relationships with people who are at the decision-making front and to keep our eyes on the long game. I mean, the, the advocacy we're doing for a Human Rights Act also has with it an, um, a recommendation for a cause of action to, to, to provide an avenue um, for a judiciable uh, question um, as distinct from um, just the, the invisible and behind the scenes advocacy that we do in relation to the particular complaints. Robert French, uh, Roz, thanks very much. That was a, a wonderful, a wonderful lecture, and certainly resonated with those of us who knew uh, Ron Wilson personally. He um, he certainly had that wicked sense of humour of which you speak. He used to chair the barristers board, the regulatory body here, and I remember appearing for a, a solicitor in a bit of strife, and the uh, complaint had been laid by the secretary of the board, who acted in all things at the direction of the chairman, who was Ron Wilson. I challenged the validity of that rule and I said, he's merely the, the puppet of the board, <laughs> Mr. Wilson, he was then the solicitor, not the puppet, Mr. French, the servant. So. <laughs> anyway, um, just a question on the Human Rights Act project. Uh, the model of a, a Human Rights Act, which we've all talked about from time to time, seems to follow the British model uh, then picked up in, uh, in the ACT and Victoria and and uh, now uh, Queensland, and at the heart of it is an interpretive rule. Um, that is to interpret statutes wherever possible um, consistently with the various fundamental human rights and freedoms which are usually scheduled in terms of the ICCPR and so forth. I know the, these, uh, these acts also contain other provisions requiring public authorities to act in accordance with, uh, with the uh, various uh, rights and freedoms. But as to the interpretive rule, um, I, I sometimes think there's a, 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 we haven't taken most of the ICCPR rights and freedoms are either reflected in existing common or are themselves rules of customary international law. It's not a big leap to seek that translation. And of course, that then feeds into the interpretive common law rule, which is called the principle of legality. That is to say, where a statute has constructional choices open, you'll choose that constructional choice which least impacts adversely on a common law right or freedom, or in that case, uh, a freedom uh, guaranteed under cost, customary international law translated in the common law. But you have to have that translation happen, and that's an act of advocacy. There was an attempt at the pushing the boundaries to say that uh, I think the uh, 98 amendments were a form of genocide. Uh, that is, in, in a case that went before the federal court, and that was that was um, thrown out. Although there was some discussion there about customary international law, but I do think that's something where advocates could perhaps uh, think a little bit harder, and so you could move in the direction of a common law equivalent of the interpretive rule you find in the human rights legislation. Uh, thank you, thank you, um, Bob, and I have, um, I've. 
had the value of your own um, exposition on the subject of um, uh, a common law bill of rights. So it was a title like that that I remembered um, and uh, that I referred to in a number of earlier discussions, particularly in the Freedoms Report that I led at the Australian Law Reform Commission. So I, I, um, I see the value of the common law approaches of which you speak. The, but the, the idea is to move things much more upstream in decision making. So um, the courts have got a role and the interpretive provision is like the, the end of the line aspect of the, the shift in decision making. And in, in reflecting on the role of the interpretive provision, say in the UK, which is, I mean, it, it's a comparative model, but it, 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 it doesn't have the issues of federalism. You know, our federal system, our constitution, is another uh, landscape on which to um, work. But I, I remember having a conversation with Lady Hale um, about two and a half years ago now, and, and I was asking her about the, the impact of the Human Rights Act in the UK on the, the way the judges um, explored questions. And, and she described it um, in a way that Lord Newberger also did not long after. It was like a... Um, a new new box of toys, and that once the, the 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 judges who were you know essentially good common law judges, fine common law judges, had a new box of to toys, um, they learned how to use them, and it changed what they did. And and I'm mindful of that in relation to the law in relation to privacy, because the common law has failed us on privacy. And it was through the influence of the Human Rights Act in the UK and its role in the courts there that the, the common law of privacy changed. Um, the difficulty is it, ta it takes to shift the common law takes a very long time. I mean, the, the, that's its beauty, but it's also its limitations. It's a very clunky thing. And um, my, my interest is really is really to look on how you change the decision maker, the decision making mental framework of public servants to try and get into that space. But um, uh, the, the discussion about interpretation is a very nuanced one. And it's, there is great strength in the principle of legality and also having it as generalized doctrine as distinct from defining it legislatively. That for me is a, is a, is a real challenge, but um, there is lots to mull on this subject, on this subject, um, Mr. French, and um, I would love to speak to you further about it um, in, in the intellectual way that um, you engage on these issues so divinely. <laughs> Hi, Commissioner Croucher, it's Robert Cunningham. Thank you so much for your talk. It's a real tour de force, and I always learn something you each time I hear you present and today was no exception so thanks so much and well it's tonight there and very late too so thanks for thanks for being up late um, giving the presentation. Um, you're about 10 times bigger than your normal size and you're looking down on me so if my voice quivers um, uh, you know I apologise but um, as I think you know, um, the, where Curtin Law School is located, uh, A.O. Neville uh, administered the stolen generation policy between essentially World War I and, and World War II, and now um, Jim Morrison and the, the West Australian Stolen Generation Alliance and others work in that building to, to, to heal uh, those wounds from the past. And something I often hear him say is that there is no healing without justice and no justice without truth. And within that context, I wondered whether or not you had any comments on the Uluru Statement uh, and where that might fit uh, in some of the themes that you've traversed today, particularly um, the, the, political, the political landscape themes, if I can put it that way. Um, I was particularly reminiscing back to um, John Howard getting back in, get, getting in in '96, and uh, the comments that you made around that. And I'm just curious to know whether or not you think that the political landscape um, is ripe uh, for uh, adopting um, the Uluru Statement in some shape or form in a, in a meaningful way uh, that would have an impact on some of the themes that you've traversed. Oops, 
sorry, I forgot to uh, unmute. Um, I remember the location very well for, for the law school, indeed. It's very special. Um, there is a time for every season under heaven uh, suddenly came to mind. And I think the, the, what, what Ron was so um, impressed with personally was his role in relation to the season that he was in. And in many respects, his work was, a, was ahead of the political moment. And he knew that he had to do that work um, regardless of the political moment. Um, the Uluru Statement is part of a, a very significant process along the same journey. There will be a moment when people are willing to listen. I, I think the way that Ron put it, you know, you have to, it begins with listening. And what the Uluru Statement, it, it wasn't just so much the statement, it was the process that led to that statement of engagement. And it has to be received in a very respectful way. And, but in that open way that Ron Wilson urged. But also in terms of politics, um, the politics of the day are obvious, they, they have their way about uh, the, the issues, the work that the Human Rights Commission does. Um, it, it's always play, it playing in an area which um, has great, um, it can be used in a, in a way that um, pits us in opposition on so many levels. But I have to say that one of the things that I've sought to do is to have the engagement focus on our work, not um, and and to shift conversations not to the to me in the role as president or any of my fellow commissioners in their personal capacity, but rather for the attention to focus on the work. And so I think you know that the difficulty was that. Um, it wasn't just the environment in which Ron delivered the report, but I think Mick Dodson had a sense of, you know, maybe we shouldn't be so technically correct in using a word that would, in a way, act so, so much against the, the good messages and energy that the report was trying to achieve. I've, I've tried to put myself back into the position of my predecessors. I did a, an Alice Tay lecture uh, some years ago, and I knew Alice as a teacher, and then I was her dean, which was an interesting flip. And then now I'm her successor in title at the commission, and her blowtorch moment was seeking to intervene in the Tampa litigation. And the intervention role I see as one of our really important roles as the Human Rights Commission. We are there with the leave of the court. We're not a party. We're advocating for the human rights that are the framing, um, the statutory mandate within which we work and put myself back in, in, into her place and I would have done the same thing. Now, the commission then got attacked and had a huge budget cut again. Um, and I've been thinking, would I have, what would, have, what would I have said to Ron when I, if I were one of the commissioners at the time. And I might have said more, as Mick Dodson said, it may be technically correct, but let's see how we can frame the findings in a way that really advances the cause that we are trying to advance. And so I'm not entirely sure that I would have argued so passionately with Ron about using that word, technically, as it could have been used, because of its, um, because many of those policies, um, they, they weren't pursued with evil intent, if I can use that sort of language. But the problem was, as policies of their day, they did have the effect that Ron observed. So um, that's a bit of a long-winded reflection. Part of not being able to see you is I'm just in my office talking to myself. But I hope some of those reflections um, are a sort of an answer to your question of it. Um, hello, my name is Elijah Kanganis, um, and I'm in year 11 from Wesley College. Um, 
uh, in your response to the previous question, you spoke about inhibitive measures implemented by the government, such as budget cuts, almost as a resistance um, to change. And I was wondering, with the modern context that we now exist within, in terms of being able to make a post on social media or being able to um, almost take your step on a, onto a soapbox and to express your opinions and your views in, in that way, I was wondering how you might have observed um, young people who want to engage in effective and, and, and almost real advocacy to make an impact, to do something beyond um, that might be considered tokenism or a, or a tokenistic um, approach. For example, making a post and, and calling it a day and how we might engage with, um, with issues like that. Uh, thank you. That's also a very thoughtful question. Um, and it, it, it poses for me um, the, the use of social media. Um, social media has a, a fantastic immediacy to it and can tap into a much, a really wide sense of community. Um, however, there are downsides in it. It is a very unmoderated uh, place of engagement. So um, from the perspective of the Commission as an, a government agency, essentially, um, we, uh, we use it, we use it actively, but in a, in a tempered way. Um, and I'm, I'm very measured and restrained in my own voice. I love doing things like this. And um, because I see my role as quasi judicial, so and supportive of the other commissioners, you see, I'm the only one that has any authority in relation to the complaints, none of the other commissioners despite their titles like race discrimination commissioner, sex discrimination commissioner, they have no role for the last 20 years in the complaints functions of the commission. So I see my role as um, providing um, that authoritative measured voice in chosen engagements like this one um, and supporting my fellow commissioners to have that, that more immediate and quick voice um, in engaging with media more directly, so radio, television, and so on. Um, whereas I keep my voice in a very um, focused way, a little bit on social media, but but I have um, I've been uh, I I've pulled back quite a bit in terms of say the Twitter engagement um, because I have um, uh, I found it very um, unmoderated and uh, but I agree with you that um, the use of various forms of social media can be a very, very powerful uh, tool for advocacy and for advancing causes of, of great merit. Are there any other questions? I think we have time for one more. Uh, Daniel from Maureen Agnew, thank you for the talk, Professor. Um, I just wanted to ask you, you mentioned obviously that after the report was tabled in Parliament that the Commission had a 40% reduction in funding and presumably it's still the position that if you upset the apple cart you risk losing funding. I was just wondering if you had any views on um, how the independence of the Commission could be better protected in terms of uh, independent funding perhaps? Uh, well, it is, a, it is an obligation of states when they, they sign up to conventions to provide a national mechanism for um, hearing complaints, amongst other things. And so the establishment of the Human Rights Commission as that national body was part of the domestic implementation of those promises. It didn't go far enough. And part of the, um, the accreditation process that the Human Rights Commission goes through internationally um, is framed within. One of the, the elements that we, is considered is the uh, sufficient funding to support the independence of the mandate. Now, for any independent agency, when I was in the Australian Law Reform Commission, the questions were the same, that it's, it's easy to trim a bit here, trim a bit there. But the, the difficulty with, with the role of the, the, my current role is that we are necessarily often in oppositional stance to government policy. We express that through um, making submissions, 
um, in uh, when parliamentary bills are being discussed, we are there's there's a submission a week on average that we are writing. So we're very actively engaged in those processes. But the reports like that one, and that report was a report under terms of reference from a government. So it had it 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 really was like the perfect storm moment for the commission and. Um, Look, the challenges to funding are an ongoing issue, I have to say. Um, I spoke about that in the recent Senate estimates um, hearing that we did. We had an efficiency review. That's very much a Sir Humphrey playbook kind of expression. But we had an efficiency review over last summer and the efficiency reviewers could find no efficiencies. Indeed, they found that we were underfunded, which is an interesting finding. Um, the... Um, uh, when, um, yes, the, the objective often of these efficiency reviews is indeed to find efficiencies. But um, it's, it's a really, uh, just to give you an example of how much this has exercised me, and, um, and this is also, I should say, a very difficult time to argue about funding. I mean, the, the federal government has put enormous funding efforts into um, uh, COVID-19 responses, um, which are a very, very welcomed um, investment um, and borrowing to do so. So it's not a good time to be arguing about funding uh, for the Commission. However, I should note that the, uh, the, 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 the tranches of funding cuts that were included in that report, the first one of those cuts brought the Commission's budget down to around 16 million. This was in 1997. Our budget now is not even 16 million. So that gives you an idea of the, the, the dramatic changes that can happen. And our, our budget as a federal agency is half that of the Productivity Commission, which has a similar uh, structure of uh, a number of commissioners, the sa basically the same number of staff that we have. So, you know, um, if you wanted to pick out within the, the, the panoply of, of agencies and agency fundings, there is a, a case that we are building at the moment to put the funding of the Commission on a proper foundation. And in time for our review as a, an A state is accredited in HRI in the international world next year. But it's, you know, it's not a it's not a good time to be making these arguments, but I want to make sure that we have very good evidence to make the case um, for that argument. Um, um, then the other issue is a receptive audience for hearing the evidence, but you have to have the evidence to start with. Thank you. On behalf of the Law Society of Western Australia, I would like to thank you, Rosalind, for a thought-provoking uh, thought lecture. I certainly took away a lot out of that, and by the questions asked by the audience, I'm sure a lot of them did too. The Law Society would also like to thank Curtin University Law School for its sponsorship of the 2021 Sir Ronald Wilson Lecture. The Law Society will also post the lecture paper and executive summary on its website as an educational resource for the year 11 and 12 politics and law students and teachers. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the Sir Ronald Wilson Lecture for 2020. Thank you for attending.